As the great Tom Waits said one time, I want to pull on your coat about something. I want to talk about trust. The word has been coming up in some of the other talks today, and I'm going to go into it deeper. Notice that? So let's talk first about, we have all been very aware of the erosion of trust in our society these days with a lot of, a lot of things that have grabbed a lot of headlines. Um, you know, we have psyops going on, we have fake news, we have um, forgeries happening, we've got um, misuse of data, overly broad collection, you know, which is um, very big, reselling the data, profiling and so on, manipulation. Um, and then we have the breaches, we have the bad stewardship of data, the failure to adequately protect it. But could it get worse? Oh yes. Let's, let's go into how it could get worse. How could this become a systemic attack? Because I don't think we're seeing enough of that kind of attack yet. We can see a lot more attacks on the integrity of data than we are seeing today. The so subtle or overt corruption of data to cause failure or simply undermine trust. Uh, first of all, you could accuse somebody of having a breach because it's very hard to prove a negative. It's really, really hard. And please, before we go any further, do not say blockchain. Please don't say blockchain. I will tell you why. Uh, first of all, you can accuse anybody of anything, and again, it's very hard to prove a negative. Uh, I don't know if you saw this headline, that there is no child porn on the blockchain. Uh, first of all, it's not possible to actually put child porn in there. Maybe a link to something that might contain child porn, but ha just having made this accusation, already trust was undermined at certain points. So this you know, proves my point right here. Uh, the other thing is that you can't prove that something hasn't been breached. Uh, this person, uh, Micah Lee, spent a lot of time with a honeypot laptop traveling around in hotels, and afterwards he would try to figure out whether it had been tampered with. And he could never prove to his own satisfaction whether he could tell whether it was tampered with or not, and he finally had, had to, to give up. So the problem with integrity attacks is that they're less noticeable than outright denial of service. Um, detecting the origin of it requires a lot of deep event logging that most organizations are just not set up to do. A lot of organizations cannot log regularly at a deep enough level. Uh, for example, they might log write events, but they cannot log every read event unless they already have some reason to believe that there might be a breach, and then they crank up the logging. But by that time, it's too late. You've missed a lot of the events that you wanted to see. Uh, if you don't know at what point the, the data was corrupted and there's chaining going on, it's, it's going to take a lot of time to figure out towards the end uh, at, at what point it happened and what you have to redo. And you may need to revalidate all that data at scale if you have so many different dependencies now, don't think just of financial data corruption uh, because you know, we've seen a lot of that, but think of um, legal documents, for example. Imagine standing up in front of a judge and saying, Your Honor, if you will look on page 85, it says this, and the judge says, that's not what a page 85 says. Even you know, punctuation in a legal contract can be a really big, big problem. Uh, imagine the subtle changing of that. Imagine the changing of, in, in food manufacturing, of your favorite frozen dinner. Um, you know, mac and cheese with like no salt in it at all. It's actually really bad. Um, imagine that sort of business data being corrupted and then having to revalidate it at some point. The problem is that the fraud departments, even if you have a fraud department, they usually don't care about non-financial transactions. In retail, for example, there are a lot of fraud departments that don't care whether somebody has logged in to a customer account that's not the customer. They don't care until they start to try to initiate a financial transaction of some kind. And that's why there's a big gap between the cyber security team and the fraud detection team. The businesses tend to be siloed, or as I like to say, cylinders of excellence. They're not silos. Um, but they tend to trust the data that they get from each other. You know, where did your data come from for this part of the business? I don't know. It was a batch job. It comes in every night. We just deal with it. So they're not examining the data very closely that comes in. 
And the big data trend that we all know and love doesn't necessarily include inventory of that data, just collect everything. So this is why I really am saying, yes, thank goodness for GDPR. You never thought you'd see that coming. But the reason why is that um, it's making businesses look at what they have, why they have it, and whether they can possibly get rid of it. They're starting to see it as toxic data that can contaminate the things that, that are, are being touched. So th this is actually a good thing. It's not nearly enough to get us towards protecting against data integrity attacks, but it's a good start. Another way that uh, is undermining trust is the practice of putting dark patterns in UI design. Um, this is a pretty uh, plain example. This is on a mobile app where there's a banner ad with a little smudge up there. And if you sit there and, and you, know, you see it on your phone and you start scratching at it, you're clicking on the banner ad and you're making money. So this is fiendishly clever. There's a whole bunch of other ones, but I, I love this example uh, most of all. There are all sorts of, of uh, dark patterns. Darkpatterns.org is a great site, by the way, that has lists uh, and examples of the sort of things that unscrupulous people put into sites like bait and switch, where you think you're signing up for one thing, but you end up with a bunch of other things in your cart, or you end up signing up for something else. Confirm shaming, I'm sure everybody's seen that one. You know, when you're, when you're asked if you want travel insurance and you have to click on, yes, I choose not to protect my investment, or yes, I want all the orphans to starve. I'm not gonna sign up for this. Misdirection, in Sam's talk, we, we saw that sort of thing. Uh, where you might, I think there was one travel site where you were, would normally get charged for choosing a seat and what you didn't realize is over on one side there was a little tiny link you could click to go choose your, your seat for free. Um, the Roach Motel, you can check in but you can't check out. We're used to certain flows going through a site and if you don't know how to get back, there's, you know, the back button doesn't work, you get stuck there. And all sorts of trick questions. Uh, some of them are accidental and some of them are, are probably purposeful. Do you want to not cancel the previous transaction? Yes, no, wait, what? <laughs> so there are a lot of those things. Uh, other techniques like abuse of what we have come to expect as an intuitive UI interface. So my, um, my oldest, before he could even read, we let him play on children's websites, and we caught him in the middle of downloading and installing a plugin. And he couldn't read, and we, did, we figured out that the way he did it was he was used to pop-ups, and he would see two little panels. One of them was, was highlighted and outlined darker than the other one. That was the default choice. And he found out that if he clicked on that one, it would make the pop-up go away, and he could go back to what he was doing. So he would just do that automatically. He was conditioned to click on the default choice uh, until he was downloading a plugin and he got to the EULA and there was no default choice between accept or cancel. And he didn't know what to do, so that's where we caught him in the process. So we are being conditioned by, in, by user interface design to expect certain things to follow certain flows and those can be abused or they can create anxiety, like only five seats left, only five tickets left for this, or artificial timeouts. How many of you sit there mentally all day wondering whether your battery in your phone is running out? It's a low level anxiety where you feel like you have to do something fast, or you're filling out a form and you gotta finish it. You can't walk away and come back because you know it's gonna time out and you'll have to do it over again. These sorts of things are all driving users to make security decisions that are not necessarily in their best interests. And the problem with malicious design, it is not an addition of malware, it is not extra code. If you look at the code, you may not necessarily see it. Unless you are a designer, you may not be able to look at something and go, you know, this is so bad, this has got to be on purpose. So it is very hard to spot that sort of thing. And unfortunately, we have so many what I call engineering grade UIs, ones that are really bad, that are, are written you know, for each other, but not for actual people who do not have the same IT background that we do. And we have been conditioned to put up with bad UIs for so long that it makes it hard for us to tr trust the software that we're using. 
And in general, we also can't trust ourselves. First of all, there's bias. That was mentioned in Sam's talk as well. Um, not just confirmation bias or, or people bias, but algorithmic bias. To the point where you cannot necessarily feed historical data in and get a result that is actually objective because there has been bias built into it from the beginning, which is causing people like Amida Lazari to call for bug bounties on bias in algorithms. We need to clean those out. There are some organizations and projects that are trying to discover this, but we have to do this first before we can rely on those. We're also kind of incapable. There's a lot of stuff we're not very good at. I don't know if you saw this great interview several years ago with Damon Cortese, who is a, a security researcher and expert. He talks about the time when he sat down to try to build his own application. And he had to go all the way through and get it functional first. And then he turned around and went back to it and found that he had put all sorts of security flaws in it. And what this teaches us is that we cannot necessarily hold the two different states in our mind at the same time. The state of making something work and the state of debugging it or the state of figuring out how it can be abused at the same time. We just mentally can't do it. And this can also play into how we can detect or not detect integrity attacks. So there was a great example that Rafael Zatra told me. He's a, a uh, journalist for the Associated Press. His father, David Sauter, was targeted by Cyber Berkut um, with leaks of e his email messages that were altered to make it look like he was a CIA influencer. Now, David Sauter is very, uh, he's very lucky. He's got a son who is very, very um, versed in um, in the tricks of cybersecurity and cyber espionage and so on, he had his son helping him look at what had happened. They had the originals of the email and they had the altered ones, but they still missed things. So one thing that they missed was where strategic deletion of these lines here made it look as though this was a larger, broader, malicious campaign rather than just helping out Radio Liberty. Uh, in this project. So if you look at it and read it carefully, you can see that by deleting the qualifier that this is just about Radio Liberty, it made it seem a lot more sinister and a lot bigger than it actually was. But they didn't see this. It wasn't until Citizen Lab stepped in and helped them that they said, oh, you missed these other parts of the emails that were altered. Because they were looking at text lengths and changes in punctuation maybe, or changes in words. They were not looking for changes in meaning that were so subtle coming from the strategic deletion of qualifiers. So again, mentally we can't always hold several states in our heads at the same time and troubleshoot these sorts of things. So how could we defend against these sorts of denial of trust attacks? Uh, first of all, we need to be able to trust ourselves. We need to be able to get better at writing software, at testing software, building in these sorts of validation and verification things. But not just that, we have to earn trust. We have to get back to earning trust from our users, for the people that we create software for. We need to be able to earn it through honesty, through talking openly about what has happened, yes, we made a mistake, here's what the mistake was, we, here's how we're going to fix it. Transparency, talking about all of it, not just part of it. And this is where a lot of breach reporting falls, falls short, where we're not hearing as much as we think we need to hear in order to re-engender that trust. We need predictability. We need to be able to know that an organization is going to treat data in a certain way, or that if you bring a, an issue to them that they're going to react in a certain way. Sometimes predict bad predictability is good. You can always count on somebody to follow their, their own interests, or you can count on an organization to have their customer's best interest in mind. Uh, capability. They can have all the best intentions in the world, but if they can't follow through on them, that's not going to engender trust. The willingness to correct mistakes instead of doubling down and saying, oh, no, 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 this is fake. This is not us. This is not how we are. Well, it sure looks like it is. 
and accountability. Sometimes being held accountable by another entity, another organization is what is going to get you the rest of the way toward earning trust. You may not trust an organization to work in your best interests, but if you feel as though there's sufficient accountability in the society or you know, from a regulatory basis or whatever, you're, you're more willing to trust it because you know they have more skin in the game. Remember trustworthy computing from Microsoft? This was talking about whether the software would work as, as advertised, as promised, but not necessarily whether it was free from abuse, free from misuse. Those are the other cases that we still have to address. And if you kind of notice the whole trustworthy computing thing, the, the trustworthy computing organization at Microsoft has kind of been spread out and disbanded. Um, it makes you kind of wonder where the priorities are now. But here's the big thing, and the one message I want to leave you with is that trust is neither binary nor permanent. You don't trust somebody all of a sudden to do anything and everything. You trust them to do specific things. I will trust my husband um, to you know, get the kids to school on time and that sort of thing, but uh, he would be really confused if it came down to um, cooking you know, one of our meal kits that comes in because you know, there are all sorts of techniques that he just hasn't picked up yet. What do you trust somebody to do in a system? Um, this is where the zero trust movement is picking up, up steam and you know, that, that's a whole other talk where I don't think it's about not trusting anything. I think it's about being non-binary in terms of what we trust our users and our systems to do. What conditions need to be true for you to, to, uh, to give that trust and for how long? Trust tends to decay over time. That's why you, know, you let somebody in from an IP address with a firewall. We've discovered that doesn't work too well over time, that we need other conditions, other policies in addition to that, and that our estimation of the risk tends to increase the longer time goes on, unless we see regular revalidation of something. So let me ask you this, what happens to a community without trust? And what happens to a society without trust? What happens if we cannot trust the platforms and software that we're using? What happens if we can't trust ourselves? And what happens if we can't trust each other? The security community is pretty bad at trust because we make everything into a game. We make it very adversarial. There are a lot of people who are willing to sit out here and go, ooh, you missed a spot. That's, you know, the, there are whole careers built around going, ooh, you missed a spot instead of fixing it. Uh, this is why we don't have enough practitioners up here on a stage going, this is what worked for me, because everybody else is waiting to go pull and shoot at it. We cannot keep doing this and work together. Uh, people here have heard of Chris Roberts, Cy Dragon, the guy who claimed to have hacked a, a, a United Airlines plane in mid-flight and made it fly sideways. Well, I hacked him. So, you know, we were sitting in a bar and there was drinking going on and he handed me his unlocked phone because he was showing me a picture. And I said, ooh, let me see that. And there you go. So, you know, even hackers can be hacked. We cannot trust each other. Did the same thing to Rob Graham. We, we were presenting together and I said, oh, I didn't bring my laptop. I just have my presentation on a USB stick. Can I plug it into your laptop? And he's like, sure. Nobody sees the middle-aged former state bureaucrat and mother of two coming. <laughs> so how can we reinforce trust? There is the, the idea of prevention. We need well-understood processes and the protection of data. We need detection. And here's where blockchain doesn't help you. It's in the ability to correct in a trustworthy way to make corrections as we go along. We learned this was wrong, we made a mistake. Here's how we're going to fix it. So that's why, yes, we need things like a continuous authentication in our systems. We need data validation from a business perspective, not just from uh, you know, a, a, uh, an integrity perspective. We need transparency and accountability. What we do not need is to hash all of the things. Hashing all the things is not gonna get us where we, we need to go. 
And here's the, the other point, which I would love to hear your opinions on. This is the conclusion I came to when building this talk, and I don't know yet whether it's right or wrong, but I suspect that trustworthy data and systems cannot be separated from trustworthy people. In other words, we cannot build a system that is inherently trustworthy if non-trustworthy people are using it or abusing it or accidentally misusing it. But I could be wrong on this. Um, you know, a lot of people are trying to solve this problem. Um, I don't think blockchain is going to solve it, but we, there have been attempts mathematically to create trustworthy systems in the past. People are still going to keep trying to do that. I hope we do. But this is just kind of where I think I've ended up personally. Now, I'm not really sure. I never know how to end these sorts of talks. I do know that we need to be able to trust each other better. We need better empathy. We need to stop scaring people as much. And we really need to be able to get away from hoodies. So that is all I know. We need fewer hoodies when it comes down to, to earning trust from ourselves and from each other. Thank you.